at age 50, it was the day after my big wonderful party, I was a little bit of a sore head. My doctor called me and freaked the hell out of me saying, your cholesterol is extremely high. I've got to get a prescription. Where's the nearest chemist to you? And she wanted to put me on statins. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to have to be on medication for the rest of my life. And I really delved into the world of functional medicine and I was recommended to Pete. This is three years later, I'm still alive. And this is proof that it works. There's alternatives, you know, there are alternatives. Hi, it's Kelly and welcome back to Me More TV. Today's video is about cholesterol. I'm gonna talk with Pete, who's my functional medicine doctor about what is cholesterol. You may know Pete from one of my previous videos Pete, welcome back. Hey, Johnny, thanks for having me. Um, today, we're exploring cholesterol. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, Pete is going to blow your mind with, well, what is cholesterol? Yeah, absolutely. So cholesterol is an essential molecule, which means that we have to have it in our body for the survival of ourselves. I think, first of all, to understand it all, we want to look at what cholesterol's role is in the body. And first of all, every single cell in the body can make cholesterol, um, with the exception of your brain synapses. Um, and they are of themselves 80% cholesterol. Cholesterol really is a molecule that's going to help to give the structure of the cells. Um, so obviously every single cell has a, like a surrounding um, envelope, which gives it such structure. And cholesterol um, is the main molecule that does that. So within that kind of cell membrane, you will have cholesterol and fat, and you will have proteins. And I think we're all under that misunderstanding that proteins are the building blocks of life kind of thing. But actually it's the fats and the cholesterol that give the structure and the shape of the cells themselves. Um, and proteins are more there as like receptors to allow things to enter the cell, move outside of the cell, etc. from there. So they're kind of very specific and, you know, will allow certain things in and not other things when they come along. So that's kind of what cholesterol is in the cells themselves, but it's also there to allow oxygen to pass in and out of the, out of the cells from there. It's the oxygen to see what we call the kind of diffuses. So it just passes through the cell membrane. It doesn't need to go through one of those proteins. So that's essentially its role. The other role is that it carries things around the body. Um, so when we're kind of saying something is either water soluble, which means it will dissolve in the blood itself, or something is fat soluble, and it has to be packaged into one of those HDLs, LDLs, which are called lipoproteins effectively. Um, and that's how they move around the body. And what I didn't tell you is I have extremely high cholesterol. My cholesterol is 8.9, but wait to see what I am now. What sort of role does cholesterol play with your hormones as well? Yeah, so that's kind of another thing that obviously we're trying to kind of work with, with yourself, isn't it, about balancing the hormones. And cholesterol is actually the backbone of pretty much all of the hormones, especially the sex hormones. And it's also the backbone of something like vitamin D, which kind of is potentially more of a hormone than it is a vitamin um, that's made when your body's um, exposed to sunlight. Um, so yeah, that's again that kind of, let's say if we look at estrogen, if we look at progesterone, testosterone, the actual core of what that molecule is made of is cholesterol. So it's everywhere. Yeah, I mean it's cholesterol everywhere. is a vital, vital kind of um, molecule for the body. We cannot live without the right levels of cholesterol in the body. So my understanding is that if I have high cholesterol, I am more prone to heart disease. I am going to have, I have a high chance of having a heart attack, having chronic heart failure. What are your thoughts on that? So there is limited evidence to say that cholesterol um, is related to heart disease risk in the sense of within, you know, a kind of reasonably broad range. I think obviously if we go really low or really high, then issues start to come into play. But it's more of a marker of risk factors elsewhere than the cholesterol itself being the true risk factor. And we'll come back to that in a moment. And I think it's important to talk about cholesterol's role in heart disease, really. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you that cholesterol isn't involved in plaque formation because it 100% is. You know, that's kind of study after study after study have shown that. When you say that. that, what do you mean, plaque formation? Yeah, so if we're kind of looking at what cardiovascular disease is and we're talking about things that are going to cause what we call an ischemic heart attack, which is where the blood flow gets reduced to the heart and the heart gets starved of oxygen and blood, basically. Mm -hmm. Ischemic stroke as well, which is when the same thing happens to the brain. And that's when the blood flow is reduced, there's a clot or a plaque that forms 
and then that can sometimes dislodge and it can float around the blood and go until it goes to like a really small capillary and then it blocks the blood flow to that okay. capillary. Um, so that's kind of what we mean by um, like a you know a heart attack or uh, what we call an ischemic stroke. And the plaque formation is what kind of precedes that. You have to have plaque for that to, to happen really. And cholesterol is part of that, but it's about the process that causes that, that's kind of, for me, kind of incorrect in the way that we think about it. It's not like cholesterol's floating around in your bloodstream waiting to kill you. Mm -hmm. It is there as a job to kind of basically serve to mop up what's going on. And I know we've spoken about the analogy of like a road traffic accident and using that as being when we have a road traffic accident, we find an ambulance and we're gonna say that the ambulances therefore are causing the road traffic accidents. We know that's not true, they're there to help with the situation. Mm -hmm. And the same can be said for plaque and cholesterol. So what generally tends to happen from the formation of a plaque is you get a kind of damage to the arterial wall. The most common cause of damage to the arterial wall is a bacterial or a fungal, what we call endotoxin, they're called lipopolysaccharides if you kind of want to look into the research a little bit more for, you, for yourself. But what happens is they're given off by bacteria and fungus, primarily in the gut, into the bloodstream, and then they are looking for somewhere to grab hold of. So they have this thing that's called like a sticky protein effectively mm -hmm. and that's just looking to attach itself to something so as it's kind of floating along in the blood and it kind of gets the arterial wall it will bind to the arterial wall and then what happens is the immune system will recognize that and it will mount an immune response to get to it so you end up with this kind of low grade inflammation that's happening on the arterial wall and then the next thing that happens is you want to take that um uh, tissue or that um damaged kind of lipopolysaccharide because it can't dissolve in the blood back to the liver. So that's where cholesterol gets involved in the first process. It's to remove that and take it to the liver for elimination. So that when you have some fat in your meal, the liver will make bile, and then the bile will break down um, fats in your gut. And then any toxins that are in that bile will bind to the fiber in your food, which is why vegetables and stuff are so important, and remove it from the body. And that's kind of the normal process. So you can then get the cholesterol in the area kind of performing that first function to remove what it is against the wall. And if another one comes along and sticks on top of that kind of injury, then you've got your first bit of plaque kind of forming. Okay. The second bit is the arterial cells themselves looking to repair. If you remember, we said that cells are predominantly the membrane itself, which is kind of what encases a cell, mm -hmm. is partly cholesterol, kind of roughly around 25% cholesterol. So you've got those cells kind of start to repair. So again, you've got cholesterol there. And then we could have um, the liver sending some nutrients to the area as well that don't dissolve in blood. So they have to be packaged into cholesterol. So they arrive to the scene. And then you maybe get one of those other bacterial endotoxins stick on again. So what you end up is this damage on top of repair. The repair doesn't quite fully happen. You get the damage again, get the repair, and you just get this buildup and this plaque formation. So you're telling me that cholesterol doesn't effectively cause heart disease? Exactly, yeah. No, it, it does not cause heart disease. So there's only really um, one kind of what we say really longitudinal study that's looked at the cholesterol levels and your risk of all-cause mortality, which is death by any cause, and also looking at heart disease. And this is the Framingham study. It's been going on since, I think, 1938. I'll put a link in the description to that study so you can see it for yourself. Basically, what that found was that for women, the healthiest um, cholesterol levels were around 5.5 and above, slightly above. So we're looking 5.5 to 6 millimoles a litre. But they say it should be below 5 they these should, days. Yeah, they should, they do, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what it also found was that when you started to go below 5.5, and they used the Pacific number, of 4.9 as well that your risk of all-cause mortality would increase by a whopping 43 percent for every 0.1 so from 4.9 to 4.8 it would increase by 43 percent but if it dropped to like 4 or 3.9 you then looking at you've got you know near 450 percent increase in all-cause mortality and actually heart disease risk was higher than that it was around 550% as opposed to 430% for that group. So there is no kind of association with having lower um, cholesterol and lower risk for heart disease. Okay, that's interesting because that is not what we've been educated in. That's not what we've been told. And whether that's, you know, high cholesterol equals heart disease, um, 
cholesterol is, don't eat the egg yolks, don't eat, you've got to eat this, this. What, what's your take on food with cholesterol? Yeah, so it's a good question because food, um, let's say the only food group that's been associated with raising your cholesterol levels is too much carbohydrates. That's the kind of big one that raises it which is almost the exact opposite to what you think because you're told that saturated fat raises it, that eating cholesterol raises it. And to put this into perspective, the liver makes all of the cholesterol that you need in a day and it will only make what you need, no more, no less. Um, so really the cholesterol is a sign of something else happening in the body that you need more cholesterol. And we'll look at that kind of in a, in a different kind of talk. But what um, they kind of found is that roughly the liver makes the equivalent of eight, eight eggs worth of cholesterol kind of in a day. And we're kind of told that we shouldn't have eggs every day because yeah. we will raise our cholesterol too much. But no one ever eats eight eggs. And what you end up is a negative feedback loop with that. So if you were to eat four eggs, then your liver would only need to make the equivalent of four eggs a day kind of thing, mm -hmm. really. So that's kind of what we know about cholesterol. But it's when it's trying to regulate your blood sugar levels that we start to look at um, like the triglyceride levels in the blood, which is an important marker for heart disease, more so than cholesterol, um, that you're actually trying to transport those triglycerides around in the blood, you need more cholesterol for that. So as your carbohydrate intake goes up, you convert those carbohydrates for storage, and that's what raises the cholesterol levels from there. So food in general, like certain foods are not going to raise your, well, those high in carbohydrates, but the ones that we're being educated about, yeah, not, yeah. not directly. Obviously, it can be down to other things that we'll, we'll talk about, like the gut biome and all of that mm. sort of stuff, on how we metabolise those foods properly. But the food directly, there is very little evidence for dietary cholesterol, saturated fats, unsaturated fats raising your cholesterol levels or lowering them for that matter. So then tell me, why do some people have high cholesterol and some people have low cholesterol? Like me, why do I have yeah. high? Let's talk about me. High cholesterol is generally a sign of something, as you said, happening in the body. Um, so that can be many, many different things. But if we kind of look at your case specifically, if you remember from the work that we did at the start, we took a urine sample test. And one of the markers that that showed was that your cell energy production cycles weren't efficient. There was something that was blocking you from utilizing your energy properly, and therefore you weren't utilizing oxygen properly as well. If you remember that kind of cycle that we kind of showed you, it was showing that it was blocked in numerous places. And that for me was causing extreme fatigue. Yeah. You know, that's when I was just absolutely wiped out. So when you can't use oxygen properly, you need more oxygen to basically create the same energy level. So if we're kind of saying that you need twice the amount of oxygen, you're potentially going to create twice the amount of free radicals. And what a free radical really is, it's when you get an oxi two oxygen molecules. So the air that we breathe is O2. And what your body actually does when it's generating oxygen is it splits those molecules in half. Mm -hmm. So then the shared electrons that they had is what gives it a charge and what makes it free radical. Because what your atoms are all looking to do is to maintain a balance. So it's balanced in when it's kind of bound together, but as soon as it splits, it becomes that unbalanced. And what you then end up is with these two oxygen molecules that are looking to try and pair with something because they want to become balanced again. And if we're not producing enough antioxidant enzymes within our cells, for, or from the liver, for the amount of um, oxygen that we're using, is that some of these oxygen levels, um, or sorry, oxygen molecules are left over, and they're looking for the first thing that they can kind of like find to, to balance themselves again. And that can be the membranes of cells or the membranes of what we call the mitochondria, which is like the little energy powerhouses within the cells. Mm -hmm. So when what we end therefore end up with is what we call oxidized fats. And that was one of the big markers that showed on your organic acid test was what we call lipid peroxidation, which is saying the fat in your body was be being damaged due to oxygen free radicals. And that for me is one of the biggest markers that raise or biggest problems that raise cholesterol. Because what, as we said at the start, was cholesterol is there to um, form your cell membranes, to kind of form brain tissue, all of that sort of stuff, your hormones. But if the, that tissue or those kind of um, fat cells or those fat molecules out in the body are getting damaged, you need to replace them with good, healthy 
um, cholesterol. So your liver is going to have to go into overdrive to create cholesterol to repair the damage that's happened through you using oxygen or not using oxygen efficiently. So that's me and my story. And so people with just normal or low cholesterol, it just means all of that is working a lot more efficiently. Yeah, yeah. And there are, you know, there are other markers and some of them are associated. If we were then to say, okay, what are the other things that potentially raise cholesterol in the body? is if you have exposure to fat soluble toxins so again bringing back to the gut health and stuff like that if the gut is creating more toxins that are fat soluble put into the blood your cells then might come across those fat soluble toxins they will make cholesterol and they will put those toxins in that cholesterol and they will send it off to the liver for elimination and the way that the liver will get it out is it um it, turns that cholesterol into something called bile, which we've touched on before, but bile is what the liver is using to kind of detox kind of everything from there. And it will store it in your gallbladder until you have a fatty meal. And then, as we said before, you have that fatty meal, it will release that bile, break down the fats of your food, and those toxins get bound up in fiber. But if someone's kind of gallbladder flow or the bile flow, should I say, sorry, is a little bit sluggish, when not that whole kind of detox and elimination process is slowed. And if you kind of think they are all the three markers that we kind of found. It's with me. You, it's yeah, exactly what's was going. fatty oxidation, gut microbes producing too many toxins. Bile flow has been your really, really big thing. And it is much more significant in women than it is for men for that one, because um, estrogen generally thickens bile and progesterone generally thins bile. And with the amount of exposure that women have to estrogen disruptors or mimickers, what we call kind of uh, phytoestrogens that are found in food naturally, um, or also what we would call um, xenoestrogens, which are kind of basically toxins in our environment that are very heavily used in skincare products, in lotions, potions, all of those sorts of things, the plastics that we're kind of exposed to a lot more and with food containers and everything like that actually disrupts that whole estrogen progesterone balance and thickens bile flow so therefore when we're trying to lower or say get stuff out of our body we don't do it as well and cholesterol can as a result build up in the body and so this for me this has been i've had high cholesterol not this high but um since i was in my 20s yeah. you know so it's been a long time of the body and the gut not not doing its job properly I might have had a little bit to do with that. <laughs> I might have not been so kind to the body, which we all in our 20s yeah. and 30s. Are. So through the work over the past, has it been a year for us now? Um, yeah, coming up to a year, it was April. Wasn't yes, it yes. So the work I've been doing with Pete, which has been fully based on supplements, mm. to, to it just to say you rebuild restore or you strip it what how do you say that <laughs> yeah so i mean there are different kind of um let's say viewpoints within the functional medicine world but it's very much kind of like remove repair restore and like the three remove, basic repair, the restore. basics the steps and you all have noticed we've kind of been in various different stages with the gut we're still in the removal phase but we've gone through the repairing phase of certain organs like the kidneys and restoring um, with probiotics and stuff like that. But there's a lot of overlap that kind of happens in the muscle testing is great for this because it actually tells us what organ needs to be stuff removed from it, what needs to repair, what needs to be restored. And it kind of takes that whole heap of information that I've got going on in my head to tell me exactly what each thing needs at each, each stage. So kind of with the supplements is the very specific supplements that are needed for Kelly. Um, so when we're kind of trying to address the balance of the microbiome, it's about looking at what is the most effective, whether it be an antibacterial, if we're trying to rebalance the bacterial levels, antifungal, what's the most appropriate supplement for her to use to help detoxify the liver for whatever stage that might be, or detoxify the kidneys. Um, everything is very kind of specific and bespoke to what Kelly's, Kelly's needs are. Um, and just on that, so, so you understand entirely what Pete does, please look at my previous video where I introduce you to Pete and as a functional medicine doctor and what he does. The other thing is, it's not a quick fix, you know, and this is what I've always been chasing as a quick fix, but I've really dedicated my time to this to give it my best shot because I'm working with a professional and, you know, I stopped drinking alcohol from January this year because to me that was just, just one more piece of the puzzle to make sure that 
that what PETA is doing, it can do its job properly. You know, if we can just eliminate one more toxin. <laughs> and I love my red wine, but I'm serious about this, you know? And my cholesterol has reduced from 8.9 to 6.7. Now in the real world, that's not too bad if it's made. I mean, that's great progress, 2.2. I know, <laughs> it's <almost> huge. <laughs> almost 30%. <laughs> exactly. And I've got friends going, what did you do? What did you do? How did you do it? Is it the food? What did you do? What did you change? And to try to explain, you know, your work. And it's really, it's, it's about... The whole physiology of the body really yeah. working. And you can't affect one area of the body without affecting the whole. Um, and I think this is where the work is. For me, it's like I'm never going to say to someone, don't take statins if that's what your doctor's advising you to do. But there are potential other ways. And for me, the way I view it is it takes a marker away that I can use to understand what's happening in your body. And actually, we're not addressing what's causing the cholesterol metabolism issues. That is still still going on. And whilst I'm not going to argue that statins does lower cholesterol, and statins do actually lower the risk of heart disease, but there are obviously side effects and alternatives. So it's about trying to counteract those by balancing it naturally, really. At age 50, it was the day after my big wonderful party, I was a little bit of a sore head. My doctor, my NHS doctor, called me and freaked the hell out of me saying, your cholesterol is extremely high, I've got to get a prescription, where's the nearest chemist to you? And she wanted to put me on statins. Now that, I was freaking out and I'm thinking, my father died of a heart attack, my brother had chronic heart failure. I'm like, Jesus, it, it's just misinformation. I've got girlfriends that are 6.5 and mm. on stats. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to have to be on medication for the rest of my life. And I really delved into the world of functional medicine and I was recommended to Pete. This is three years later. I'm still alive. And this is proof that it works. There's alternatives. You know, there are alternatives. You see, this is the thing, as, as you said, with settings. As soon as they kick in, you can't do your job because they, they clear the markers or it removes. Yeah, it takes, you know, we're using all of all of the biological markers in the blood. So whether it be cholesterol levels, whether it be some of the immune markers, blood sugar levels, all of that sort of stuff to formulate what's, what's happening. And the problem with statins is they just block um, cholesterol metabolism in the liver. So they stop your liver from creating cholesterol and they also cause reabsorption of cholesterol within the liver as well. So when your body's maybe trying to repair brain tissue or neural tissue or just cell membranes, it's actually impairing the liver's ability to provide the cholesterol that the body needs. It's, but isn't that dangerous? It has its increased risk of other diseases. There you go. Not to say, you know, some people I know, a lot of people out there are on them and may have to be on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if you disagree with that. I think it's finding that balance, isn't it, about where the potential risk factors are, but you should always try and address the core issues as well. And it might be something that people would go on statins to get it to what they would consider like a safer level. And then whilst they're doing the work underneath and then come off them, but each person's journey is their, their own. That's it. We're all unique. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Remember, I make lots of other videos on beauty, lifestyle, and paleo. So don't forget to give me the thumbs up and please subscribe and click on the notification bell so you can be notified when my next video comes up.